Hello, it's me, and I pulled this Fisher Cube out to do a little bit of an update on the question that was posed with this. Now, as you recall, I did the um, tutorial with this part as the top uh, because it looks more like a like the cube part, you know, like a Rubik's Cube. This part here is the middle, and this is the bottom. But the actual question that was posed is, what if I tried using this as the top, this is the middle, and this is the bottom? And that actually is harder because you bring out kind of a false equivocation with this, something of a parody. So I'm going to re-scramble this and now use it, solve it during uh, doing that method, biology. So you've already seen me scramble it once. I'll scramble it the rest of the way. Abracadabra. Okay, so let's actually find our way through the real challenge that was supposed to happen with this. So let's arbitrarily pick this one, the green and the red side, and try to get the cross. So what I'm going to be using is the green and red that matches with this yellow. Uh, so let's see if we can find it. Green and red right over here. Actually, this is with the white. That's okay, too. So I'm going to move this in and up. So this is where it needs to be. Lined up with this white center. Now, what I should do first, perhaps, is line up these other centers as well. So I'm going to turn this over here because that would mean that it's lined up here. That this red is coinciding with this. This doesn't seem to matter. This green is already lined up with this. And this doesn't matter either. So basically, these centers are properly oriented. So here's the green and red. I've got to move that to over here. So let's move this down like so. Turn it in. Turn it up. No problems. And now we're left with what goes here, which is going to be a green one, which spans here. So understand that, that I have two types of edges. I've got the bicolored edge that matches this, which matches the, the white and the yellow side in my puzzle. And then I've got the straight colors that match these two colors over here. Obviously, this comes like so. All right, so here's the red edge that comes into here in between these two reds. So we just find our way through. Now this one does not have a specific orientation, this edge. These edges of course did. This had to be facing down, this had to be facing up. With this, doesn't matter. You've got rotational symmetry here. So we can move this down. Remembering that we've got to move this back. So move this down, cross back to put this back in. Move this to the side. Double turn the red down so it can meet the red here and move it up. No problems. Now we just have to find the green to do the same thing. Is it down here somewhere? Nope. So it's right here. So that's no problem. We just move it down. And now we match it to where it's supposed to be. Double turn. Bring it in. Double turn. So you can see we've got the cross nicely here. Now we put in edges. This edge over here is going to be the green and white, uh, rather red and white. Let's see what we got going on over here. Here's the red and white over here. So we just turn this into here. Turn, turn, and up. So we're doing well here. Green and white right over here. Turn, turn. We'll just keep doing it until it finds its way in. So, so far, simple stuff. Nothing really tricky about this guy yet. Green and yellow. Do we see it? No, maybe the red and yellow is down here. Yep, right over here. So, turn, turn. And just intuitively turning it so that we can put it in. There we go. Now the green and yellow should be down here. Turn, turn, turn. Okay, so we have our first side over here, our first layer. So now we turn this upside down and place in our edges only layer. You can see this one is already in, so we're doing well there. And now what? Now before when you did the first Fisher solve, the middle layer was these. So these could have some rotational symmetry, which means you could get false equivocation between this and the edges on the top. Here, every edge has a specific orientation, so we don't run into that. For instance, here, this is blue and orange. Here's a blue and orange over here with the white. Never mind that. So let's see what's supposed to be where. For here, I'm looking for the yellow, green, and orange, which is over here. It's in the wrong place. So let's just bump this out. This guy really likes to turn. Usually not in the direction I want it to, though. Okay. 
so it's over here. So this belongs here, only in this configuration. So there won't be any mistaking what that's supposed to be. So turn, 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 turn. And you can see, whoops, fits nicely over here. Okay, this is in the right place, but it's oriented wrong. So let's bump it out, put it in right. Okay, so now this flips down here. Yep, the white's gonna end up here, the red is gonna be down, blue is gonna be up over here. So again, so far no tricks with this. Usually the second layer is among the easiest of the layers to place. Not too many tricks here. Turn and turn. Okay, so far so good. We have to put this one, which is gonna be this guy, and this is gonna be brought in down over here so this yellow can be with this yellow. Turn, 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 turn. Turn, turn, turn. Now you're probably thinking, no problems. So here we are again at the last layer and let's see how this one works. So in order to decide what's right side up and what's upside down, you can tell that this is right side up here because even though it's placed wrong in relation to this center, it's still in the right um, orientation regarding positioning. It's right side up. The first thing to do, of course, is always get this back in its position that it's supposed to be. So this is quite obviously right side up, and this is obviously upside down. What about these two? Well, it doesn't matter. This could be right side up or upside down. It's equivalent in both directions, and there's two of them. So I can arbitrarily define it as any of them. So what I'm gonna say is this is right side up. Let's just say this is right side up, so I have the line. And this is upside down, and this is upside down. I could say these two are right side up, then I just have to spin that algorithm twice. But why do that? So just go F, R, U, Ri, Ui, Fi. So now everything should be right side up. So the next step at this point is we find one that's in, and there should just be one that's in, and then do our permutation of our edges until they're all in. When you look at this, you see something a little strange. Two are in. Sometimes you'll see it in this configuration, or R, U, R, I, U, R, two, U, R, I. But in any case, you notice that two are in and two are out. You cannot get that on a three by three. That appears to break the parity of this puzzle. You will always, 100% of the time, get one of them in and three out. The reason for that is because you simply can't scramble it in this position. Because according to the law of cubes, you can, uh, you can only swap an even number. I have two here that need to be swapped, which is one swap and one is odd, so that's an odd number swap, which you can't have. So that's why you sh should only have one in and three out, because that's the equivalent of two swaps, one and then two. So how did this happen? Well, when I see this, the only time that I'll see this is with an even number puzzle, like a four by four, because that way what I could do is I can dive into the the reducted edges that I had and reset them. But I can't do that here. So when I see that, it means there was some sort of false equivocation. I placed something wrong thinking that it was the same. But what was it? What could have done that? So let's say I hold this here and I try it again, or we'll hold it from here, R. Yeah, actually we'll hold it from here, R, U, R, I, U, R, two, U, R, I. And as you can see, these are in and these aren't. Well, what could be false equivocated? It was nothing on, in terms of the edges here. These edges all have a very specific place. How about the edges here? Well, no, because they're two. So I do have a way of orienting this. I do have a way of moving these so that they rotate and you don't rotate these guys over here. Uh, the problem with that is if I rotate that, then it's one swap. Something else has to be swapped. What's going to happen with this algorithm is that this is going to rotate as well. And that algorithm that I use to swap these is R to U, R to U, R to U, R to U, R. Great. It swapped that, right? We're good. Not so fast. This got rotated. It had to get rotated because we know the laws of cubes and I simply could not just do one swap without swapping another. So this had to rotate by one. So we're not done yet. So how can we get through this? And how did this happen? Now let me have you guess first and then we'll 
we'll jump right into it. In the meantime, I'll get this back. Okay, there you go, so now that's back. The whole key is this puzzle is very predictable. We can predictably decide what's going to happen with a parody. Well, let's take a look around. We've got one with a very specific center, but there's one part of this puzzle that is not a super cube, and that's these centers. The time that you get parity with edges like this is either because you falsely equivocated another edge that had to be swapped that you've seen before with a, two, a three up and one down, or you falsely equivocated a center. Now, that can happen in terms of rotation on a 4x4. Four four. We've seen that where you had to put the centers in right. If you didn't, then you had kind of a rotation of the, of the top. Here, this has actual equivalency in all 90 degrees. This could be rotated here, here, or here. You wouldn't notice any difference, but the puzzle knows. This is actually rotated wrong. And because it's rotated wrong, it's going to cause this parity over here. This or this, any one of those. So what actually has to happen is, although you had no way of knowing it, when we were solving this and putting these in, um, we knew the specific rotation of this in relation to this first layer. We didn't know the specific rotation of that, and we falsely assumed it didn't matter, but it actually does. So the problem with this, and the reason why you get this parity, is because this has to be rotated by 90 degrees. That way, I can swap these two, and swap this once, and you wouldn't notice a difference. Here, you would if you had a 90 degree rotation here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to coordinate this again to where these two are out. I mean, I could just move it here and do it. Actually, why don't I do it that way? So I'm going to do the same algorithm, but with this center to the right. This will rotate and it won't even matter. And that's how I'm going to get this back. So R to U, R to U, R to U, R to U, R. You can say to you. So this is back, and this doesn't mean a thing. So now this is rotated correctly, and I can even bring this back. Now by doing that, admittedly what that did is it does mess up the corners of your first layer, but that's easily put back in. Basically we've recalibrated, uh, recalibrated the puzzle. This belongs here, uh, but the one that belongs here is this green one. So what I'm going to do is just move this down. Well, actually we'll do it this way here, move this down, across, and up. That blasts this red one out, so down, across, and up. So you can see we easily got this first layer back, turn this here, we have to get our um, edges back over here, which again is no problem at all. This is gonna come over here, be brought down here. So it's kind of a partial re-scramble, but it's only because you didn't set that center right to begin with. And because it's just a three by three mod, it's easily done. So now this is going to rotate into here from left to right, turn, 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 and turn. Okay, so now, so now we know what we have to do. These two are upside down. I'm going to say these two are right side up. So F R U R I U I. Fi, predictably these are now right side up, and now it's fine, because now you see one is in and three are out. Why? Because we rotated this in the correct configuration, even though we had no way of knowing what that is. Again, it had the appearance of parity, but it was really placement, hidden placement, false equivocation of one rotation for another on the center that's the only center that's not a super cube. Once I do that, I do my permutation here, R U, R I U, R to U, R I, not yet. R U, R I, U, R, to U, R I, and we are good. We got it. Now it's just a matter of corners, and I have no fear with these because there's no equivocating here. So none of them are in. We do our usual algorithm. This is in. If one is in, either they're all in, or only one is in. In this case, just one. So we do our algorithm here. Again, I'm assuming knowledge of Rubik's Cube, and bang, and then it's solved. So that's how you do it. And I think that that was the true question that the viewer had of the Fisher Cube. So sorry about the misunderstanding, but that's how you do it. Again, if you ever run into that situation where two are out, you have rotated this wrong, do the algorithm with this at the side, the R to you, R to you, R to you, until it comes back. This will be placed right, this will be placed right, Get your top layer and middle layer back, and you will have done it. Hope that helps. 
Thanks for watching.